have undertaken to draw up an account of the things that have been fulfilled among us, just as they were handed down to us by those who, from the first, were eyewitnesses and servants of the word. With this in mind, since I myself have carefully investigated everything from the beginning, I too decided to write an orderly account for you, most excellent Theophilus. Well, a couple of months ago, uh, Meg and I went out on a date to a restaurant that we had never been to, and it was a much classier place than we normally go to, but someone had given us a gift card, so we were excited to give this place a try. And so we showed up and we looked at the menu, and it had a lot of things we've never heard of before, uh, quite a bit of fancy food. It's one of those situations where you have to Google the menu just to know what you're working with. And as we're working through this, as we're working through the menu, we noticed that they had pizza on it, so we felt safe and secure, and so we got some pizza. And before the pizza came out, uh, I asked our server, I said, hey, could you bring out a side of ranch or do you guys have ranch? And as soon as I said that, I realized I made a big mistake uh, because he rolled his eyes at me and looked at me with utter disgust. And what he said was, he said, uh, we don't have ranch or anything remotely close to ranch. That's how he, that's what he said to me. <laughs> And I said, okay, but what about spicy ranch or chipotle ranch? Do you have either of those? No, I didn't say that, but the, the snarky side of me wanted to respond in a snarky way. Now, besides that, we had a great experience that evening. It was, food was good, environment was great, but that server and that little exchange put a bad taste in our mouths. And it wasn't because of the information that he gave us. The information was simple, here it is. We don't have ranch or anything remotely close to ranch. That information I can handle, and there's no problem. It's easy to understand. It's not complicated. So it wasn't the information, but it was his attitude. Uh, his attitude said this, you are a moron, and you obviously don't belong here. Now, that might be a true uh, assessment of the situation, but it spoiled a little bit of our time. And again, it wasn't because of the words or the information that was communicated, but it was because of the attitude behind what was communicated. And I think this encounter highlights three really simple truths that are important to the text we're gonna be looking at tonight. And here's the first one, is that your words and actions are very important. What you actually say and what you actually do is very important in your relationship with God and with people. But there's more than that. It's, it's, there, there's more to the human experience than just words and actions. There is an attitude that is behind it. And so this is the si second simple truth is that your attitude or the attitude behind your words and actions is equally important, sometimes even more important than your words and actions. It is the attitude that often comes through in your relationships with people. Now, I don't wanna minimize the importance of what you actually say and what you actually do, but I also don't wanna minimize the importance of having the right attitude, the importance of learning how to carry yourself right and have a, a proper disposition before God and man. This is such an important thing. See, the majority of relational conflict in the world today is not over the precise meaning of words. That's not primarily why there's conflict in the world. It's not over the precise meaning of what someone has said, but it's over the perceived attitude behind the words of the other person. So you hear people say stuff like this, you know, my wife, she's wearing her sassy pants today. That has very little to do with what she's communicating. Or someone will say, my husband is about as sensitive and perceptive as a cow today. That's not a statement necessarily about the words. It's about the attitude that is behind the words. And in the passage we're gonna be looking at tonight, Jesus is gonna give us four commands. And all four of these commands are aimed at your inner attitudes. They're aimed at the, the attitudes by which you live your whole life. And this is the third simple truth, is that Jesus cares deeply about our attitudes towards people, including your enemies. Jesus cares deeply about your, your inner attitudes towards people. I love that Jesus gives us commands about how we must think and feel about people. He, he's not only concerned about our exter exterior behavior, but he aims right at our hearts. He goes right at our hearts, and he's, he's going to instruct us and command us how we are to think and feel towards other people. 
Now, these four commands break down into two different categories. There are two negative commands and there are two positive commands. The negative commands are, number one, do not judge others. Number two, do not condemn others. The positive commands are forgive others. And the second positive command is give to others. And tonight, we're going to focus primarily on these first two negative commands because if we get these first two right, then it will be easy to get the other two right. But if we get the first two wrong, we get these first two commands wrong, it is impossible to get the next two right. So here we go. Let's look at the first two commands. Here they are. Command number one, do not judge. Command number two, do not condemn. This is what it says. Do not judge and you will not be judged. Do not condemn and you will not be condemned. Forgive and it will be forgiven. Give and it will be given to you. A good measure pressed down, shaken together, and running over will be poured <clears throat> into your lap. For with the measure you use, it will be measured back to you. Okay, so what do these commands mean? He just gives us quickly these four different commands. But what do these first two commands mean? Do not judge and do not condemn. Well, in order to answer that question, we need to understand what Jesus is not saying what he cannot be saying here. First is that Jesus is not forbidding all forms of judgment. This needs to be crystal clear in your minds if you're gonna make any sense uh, out of what Jesus is saying. Jesus is not forbidding all forms of judgment. He's not forbidding Olympic judges from judging. He's not forbidding chili tasting judges from judging or professors from judging your papers. He's not forbidding Judge Judy from judging or whatever. He's not forbidding all forms of of, of judgment. That, there's no way that's what he's saying. The second thing he's not saying, or another way to put it, is that Jesus is not forbidding Christians from making judgments about people and situations. Jesus is, he, when he gives this command, he's not looking at you and saying, okay, Christian, you cannot make any moral judgments. You are not allowed to make any moral judgments. See, I'm, I am convinced that verse 37 is the only verse in the Bible that every American has memorized. I mean, every single American I've ever talked to has verse 37 memorized. Do not judge lest ye be judged. And this is typically brought up when a Christian or a person is making a moral judgment. They're saying, this is right and this is wrong. The response to statements like that in our culture are, do not judge. Remember what Jesus says? Aren't you a follower of Jesus? And Jesus says, do not judge judge. But is that what Jesus is saying here? Is he saying, you Christian, you're never allowed to make any moral judgments. You're never allowed to say that something is right and something is wrong. Is that the proper application? Well, the answer is no. Jesus is not forbidding Christians from making moral judgments about people and situations. Now, how do we know this? How do we know that Jesus is not actually forbidding us from making moral judgments? Well, first is that it's impossible not to make an evaluation about a person in a situation. It, it's actually impossible not to make some sort of evaluation. You can't make or not make some sort of evaluation. You know, oftentimes when I'm sharing the gospel with someone, I'll be communicating what the gospel says, and they'll say, wait a second, doesn't Jesus say, do not judge? Aren't you being a little bit judgmental? To which I respond by saying, are you judging my judging? Is that what's happening here? Are you judging my judging? And they'll say no, then I'll say, well, you said I'm judgmental, which is a judgment about my judgment. So please stop judging me for judging you. Please don't do that. And then they say, oh, okay, I get it. Okay, okay. Well, usually that's what they say. And see, even, the evalu even making the evaluation that you're not going to make an evaluation is an evaluation. It's not possible to not make some sort of evaluation, some sort of judgment in the situation. The second reason we know Jesus is not forbidding Christians from making moral judgments is because Jesus instructs us to judge. In the same passage where Jesus says, do not judge and you will, you will not be judged, he gives us instructions on how to judge. So in verse 41, he says, why do you look at the splinter in your brother's eye, but don't notice the beam of wood in your own eye? Or how can you say to your brother, brother, let me take out the splinter that is in your eye. When you yourself don't see the beam of wood in your eye, hypocrite, first take the beam out of your eye, and then you'll see clearly to take the splinter out of your brother's eye. You know, have you ever gotten something in your eye? Like a, a bug flies into your eye, or you get sawdust in your eye, and you're not by uh, a mirror? And what you, you might do is you might go up to someone and kind of hold your eye open and say, hey, can you see, is there a bug in there? Is there a little twig in there? Is there something in there? And you're holding it up, and you're saying, can you see? And in verse 42, Jesus says, 
He says this, okay, so you're looking at your brother and you see the bug. You see the splinter in your brother's eye. He says, how in the world are you going to see that accurately if you have a beam in your own eye? The word beam here is the word dokos, which means the main support beam in a house or a building. That is what the Greek word means. So it's not like just a simple two, two by four in the eye. He's talking about like a telephone pole. So the, the image we should have in our mind is of a man like a cyclops with a telephone pole coming out of his head walking around. This is the image that we should have. And he's saying, how in the world are you going to see that little speck in your brother's eye if you can't even get close enough to him? Otherwise, you'll knock him out with your telephone pole head or whatever that is. He says, you can't do it. You're blinded by your own pole, your own beam that is in your eye. So what does he say? First, take the beam of wood out of your eye and then you will see clearly to take out the splinter in your brother's eye. So he says, okay, once you take the beam out of your eye, then you can properly judge. Then you can properly judge. And so in the same passage, we see Jesus, where Jesus says, do not judge and you will not be judged. He's also giving instructions on how to judge. So there's no way that Jesus is saying that you cannot correct sin, that you cannot correct error. That, that, that can't be what he's saying because he later explains how you should correct sin and error. And all throughout the Bible, we are commanded to make judgments about people. Jesus says in the parallel passage in Matthew chapter 7, he says, don't give what is holy to dogs. Don't cast your pearls before swine, which means Jesus says, those are dogs and those are swine. That is a judgmental thing. Or later he says, uh, you need to be aware of false teachers, so you need to make an evaluation. Is this teacher false or true. You have to make a judgment about who they are. So we're instructed over and over and over and over and over again to make moral judgments. Leviticus 19.17 says this, do not hate your fellow Israelite in your heart. Rebuke your neighbor frankly so you will not share in their guilt. Now notice the connection between the first sentence and the second. It says, do not hate your fellow Israelite in your heart. How might you hate a fellow brother or sister? Well, one way to hate them would be to not rebuke your neighbor, frankly. It's, it's, and it makes perfect sense that if you see your brother headed down a path where they're going to destroy their lives and you stand by quietly, that is functionally hate. It's hate to not speak up. And so there's this connection here between loving someone and actually making some sort of moral judgment. You know, one time I was out for a run and I was running on Ashworth, and Ashworth can be a busy street. And I saw this little boy going down the street. He was running into Ashworth from his neighborhood. And he was probably two or three years old. He had his incredible Hulk helmet on, his tricy tricycle, two or three years old. And I looked at the situation, and I said, he's in his own world. He's probably thinking about Legos or ice cream or maybe nothing at all. I don't know what was in his head. But he, he is, he's just daydreaming, and I'm like, he's going to cross the street. And so I got in front of him, and I stopped his bike, and I turned him around and took him back to his house. Now, had I seen this situation, and I, I said this, judge not, and I will not be judged. I will make no judgment here. And I let this little boy go into the street. I would feel like I was actually participating in the harm done to that child, if there was harm. I would actually particip be participating in it. And I would be participating in the pain that the family experienced, or I would be partly, in some ways, to blame. That when I returned this little boy back to his house, his mom didn't look at me and say, Luke 6, 37, do not judge and you will not be judged. Why did you judge that my son was ill-prepared to cross the street? That's not what happened. There was a sense of thank you, thank you, because you helped my son. And so it's important for us to see that, that judgment, see, in our culture that we live in, any type of judgment, any type of moral statement about something being right or wrong is considered anti-loving. But that is not what the scriptures teach at all. The, the, the scriptures teach that if you love someone and you see error, you see sin, that there's a way you need to go about communicating that. You know, have you ever had that ex that experience where you get home at 8 p.m. at night and you look in the mirror and you have a piece of food stuck in your teeth, 
like a piece of lettuce. It's in your teeth, and you said, I ate that at noon. And I've been in meetings for the last eight hours with people. And I'm, I'm, you're thinking about all the people you talk to, and you think, okay, that's why they were laughing so hard at my jokes, because I'm the joke. They're laughing at me because I look like an idiot. And you come to the conclusion, no one loves me. At least no one loves me enough to tell me I have lettuce in my teeth. And see, it's not an unloving thing to say you have lettuce in your teeth when you have lettuce in your teeth. And so as Christians, if we buy into the narrative that any type of moral judgment or any type of correction is, anti, is actually anti-love, I think we're, we're going to get thrown way off the intended path Jesus wants us to go down. So there's no possible way Christians are to live this life where we never correct sin or never confront error. Uh, that, that, that is not what Jesus is teaching at all. Okay, so what is he teaching then? I mean, why, why does he say, do not judge and you will not be judged, do not condemn and you will not be condemned. Okay, so what is he forbidding? Here's the answer. Jesus is forbidding a hypocritical, superficial, and judgmental attitude towards people. This is what Jesus is zeroing in on. It is a hypocritical, judgmental, and condemning spirit attitude towards people. The pharisaical system where Jesus was at, the pharisaical system dominated that part of the world. And the pharisaical system turned people into the most judgmental and condemning people on the planet. And what they did is they, they used their man-made rules to criticize everybody, to club everybody over the head. They used their man-made rules to point the finger at people and talk about why they're not right with God and why they shouldn't be right with people. Now, to be clear, Jesus isn't saying that a critical judgmental, condemning spirit is unique to the Pharisees. It wasn't just the Pharisees that were doing this. Because, see, human beings, this is the hu part of the human condition. The human condition all over the world for all time has been made up of people who, who, are, who are inclined to complain, who are inclined to be critical, who have a judgmental and condemning spirit. This is part of the human condition. Winston Churchill said this, have you enemies? Good. That means you've stood up for something sometime in your life. So if you, he's just saying, if you stand up for anything, you will receive criticism. Someone will condemn you. Aristotle says to avoid criticism, say nothing, do nothing, be nothing. Dale Carnegie said, any fool can criticize, condemn, and complain, and most fools do. This is a statement about just the human experience. If you say anything, you do anything, you stand up for anything, you will be criticized. Is it because the whole world is filled with Pharisees who have bought into the Pharisaical system? No. It is because this is part of the human condition. And so this judgmental and condemning spirit is just part of what is in our DNA as fallen creatures. And Jesus is making the point that the Pharisaical system won't solve the problem. Religion won't solve this judgmental spirit problem. In fact, the teachings of the Pharisees actually energized and justified the natural judgmental and condemning spirit we all have. That's what it did. That's what religion did then, is it energized and justified this critical spirit that everybody already has in them. This is what was driving the Pharisees. It was this quest for power where they were coming down and condemning everybody. And Jesus is saying to them, and he's saying to us, he's saying to you, that if you're going to follow me, you must get rid of this hypocritical, judgmental, and superficial attitude towards people. You have to get rid of it. This is, that's not part of the kingdom values. This is not how Jesus wants us to live. If you look back at Luke 6.42, he says, hypocrite. Hypocrite. This is what he's dealing with. Hypocrite. First, take the beam of wood out of your eye. Then you will see clearly to take the splinter out of your brother's eye. The Pharisees were the sin police, and they were full of hypocrisy, investigating every little thing and then condemning, 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 condemning. He says, how in the world can you judge properly? How in the world can you see the splinter in your brother's eye if you ignore the beam of wood in your own eye, that is hypocritical judgment. Or you look at John 7, 24, he says, stop judging by outward appearances and start judging justly. 
He doesn't just say stop judging. He says stop judging by outward appearances and start judging justly. The word outward appearances is the word opsis. It means the face of something or someone. It is the first thing that you see. That's, this is what the word means. You, you, come, you meet someone, it's just their, the first thing that you see. You get into a situation, it's just what's on the surface. He says stop just looking at those things and start judging justly. Start judging according to righteousness. And this is the way the Pharisees operated. They were hypocritical, they were superficial, and they only cared about how things looked. And this, this standard that they created was not the word of God. It was the standard that they created. And so it produced this incredible self-righteousness in them. And Jesus is saying this, if you're gonna follow me, if you're gonna be a disciple, if you're gonna be in the kingdom of God, it, it, you, your, your exterior life certainly must change. Your, relation, your individual relationship with God is incredibly important. But he says, if you're going to be my follower, your inner attitudes towards people are a really big deal. And you need to get rid of this condemning spirit. And so as I've been working through this passage, there's one question that keeps popping up in my mind just over and over and over and over again. I, I, it's like I can't get away from it, so I just have to deal with this question. And here's the question. What do we do with verses like John 7, 24 in light of Luke 6, 37? So what do we, this is the main question. What do we do with John 7, 24 in light of Luke 7, 20, or 37? Luke 6, 37, I should say, says this. Do not judge and you will not be judged. Do not condemn and you will not be condemned. Forgive and it will be forgiven. So the heart of what he's saying is don't walk around with this judgmental spirit. But then in John 7, it says stop judging by outward appearances and start judging justly. So here's the tension. Are you ready for the tension? We are supposed to judge. We are. That's what he says. Start judging justly. We need to make moral evaluations. We, we need to discern what is right. We need to discern error. We need to discern what is best. But at the same time, we're not supposed to have this critical, condemning spirit, which is an incredibly difficult task for us as human beings. It is so difficult for us to make moral judgments, to, to observe what is wrong, and not rise up with this condemning spirit towards people. I mean, we, li we live in a world that is filled with error, and the church until the Lord returns is going to be filled with error. There's going to be sin. There's going to be sin in our lives that need to be corrected, and sin in other people's lives that needs to be corrected. So how do, how do we live in this world where we obey both commands? Don't have a judgmental spirit, and yet we need to start judging justly. How do we do it? Two things. Number one. First, recognize your propensity towards hypocrisy. This is where we have to start. You, you need to, if, you're, if we're going to get this balance right, if we're going to obey Jesus on both fronts, we need to recognize our propensity towards hypocrisy. We need to recognize that naturally we are hypocritical in our judgment of other people. That this is just part of our fallen state, that naturally we are hypocritical. Luke 6 says, why do you look at the splinter in your brother's eye, but don't notice the beam of wood in your own eye? This is just, I, I believe Jesus is talking about the Pharisees here, but this is just the human condition. He's like, Jesus is just looking, and he says, you're all, you're, you're all concerned about these, these little things in people's lives, and you have this thing coming out of your head, and you don't see it. This is just a statement about our human experience. He says, hypocrite, hypocrite. So if we're, gonna, if we're gonna live in this tension, I think we, have to, we just need to start here. Hypo hypocrisy in our judgment is the norm, it's the default. Uh, this week I made 10 ways, I just wrote a list of 10 ways we are naturally hypocritical in our judgment. I just came up with 10, and I'm only gonna give you two because it's gonna take too long, but there are two ways that I think just highlights the reality of our inherent hypocrisy in our judgment of other people. First is that we judge people, I'm saying naturally, we judge people by what they do and we judge ourselves by what we would do. This comes up in conversations all the time. And the way it works is this, is we say this, man, if I had, if I had that type of money, I would never spend it like that. You look at people who have more money than you do and you say, if I had that type of money, I would never spend it like that. Or we, 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 we'd say, I would just be so much more generous than that person. Or if I was in that situation, I would never cave under that pressure. 
I mean, we look at people who are under pressure and they, they give in. We say, how can they do that? I mean, how can they do that? How can we do that? And it justifies this negative, condescending attitude towards them because in the back of our minds, this is what we tell ourselves. If I had that type of money, I would be more generous. Or if I was in that position, I would stand straight. I wouldn't let the pressure get to me. And so what we're doing at the, very, at the very bottom line, at the very foundation, what we're doing is we're judging people according to what they do and we're judging ourselves on the basis of what we think we would do. This is just, in my mind, it just highlights the reality of how we're wired. It is a form of hypocritical judgment. We're not comparing apples to apples. Another way our judgment is hypocritical is that other people's excuses are usually bogus, but our excuses are legit. We, we assume that the excuses other people give us are usually bogus, but our excuses are to be unquestioned and regarded as totally legit, like completely legit. I think this is our default. During Mission to the City, my wife and kids, they were doing some gardening with a couple, other, a couple of other groups at a garden here in Des Moines. And while they were there, these little gardener snakes started popping up all over the place, and my kids scooped them up. So they're scooping up these gardener snakes. And we were going to meet for lunch down at the church, and so my kids uh, thoughtfully brought some gardener snakes. And so here's, here's a picture of one of the gardener snakes. That's a pretty little girl right there holding that snake. And, um, and I need you to notice something that's right above Myla's head. Okay, so right above Myla's head right here, yeah, that's my wife Meg. And uh, she's working hard, and she's wearing a tank top. And one of my boys had this idea. And the, the idea was to take her tank top and open it up and throw a snake down the back of her shirt. And so she did, or so they did. And so a little pandemonium broke out in the kid's center, and it was fine. He was wise enough to position himself to pull it, pull it out quickly. But he threw the snake down the back of her shirt. So shortly after that, I had a little conversation with this Son, I said, son, your mom loves you a lot. She's a very good woman. But if you do that again, she will end you. And, <laughs> and I won't be able to stop it. So that was really not a good idea. And he was kind of like, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. I know it was, okay, I knew that was not a good idea. I knew it. Nobody got hurt, no trouble. But as I was talking with him, this is what was very clear. He says, yes, I know that was not a good idea, but here are my four excuses that he fed me as to why it is okay. He gave me these excuses. And as he was giving them to me, he noticed that I was not eating them up like pure gold. I was just kind of like, come on, man. You know, and so he's, he's telling me his excuses, and there's a little tension because he knows I'm not really buying his excuses, but they were totally legitimate in his mind. And I've noticed with kids, my kids at least, when they get into trouble or they do something they're not supposed to, they tend to make excuses, and they expect the parents to just eat them up, and they expect their siblings to eat them up. But when the sib- other siblings give them excuses, they treat them like pure garbage. They're like, that's just an excuse. This doesn't make any sense. And I think what this highlights is just the reality that naturally we tend to give ourselves the benefit of the doubt. We, we give ourselves the benefit of the doubt with our excuses. We give someone an excuse, and we expect them to just take it. But people give us excuses, and a lot of times we don't take them. We don't accept those things. We think that just sounds like an excuse to us. And this benefit of the doubt that we give ourselves, we tend to give that benefit of the doubt to the people we like. But if I have some reason not to like you, when they make an excuse, I reject it. I I say, yeah, I'm not going to buy it. You might not say it that way, but in the back of your mind, you're thinking, I'm going to flush that excuse down the toilet where it belongs. That's a bunch of nonsense. And so what happens is that from the very get-go, we are biased. We're biased towards our own excuses. We're, we tend to justify ourselves based off our circumstances, but when it comes to other people, we tend to not, naturally, we are not that forgiving. We tend to hold people to the line based off of what they actually do. And so this bias in our attitude makes our judgment lean hypocritical. And let me explain why hypocrisy is utterly devastating and what we're trying to accomplish in the kingdom of God. Let me, let, me, let me explain why it's terrible. Now, there's a, a picture that I saw that I think kind of highlights this reality if you want to put this picture up. But this is what it says. It's a, this is a city vehicle that says, give cyclists space. Now, when I see this, let me just tell you what happens in my mind. I think this is inherently contradic- contradictory. Like, you would be better off not doing anything. You're actually blocking 
the place where people are supposed to ride their bike. And so now, when I see this, I don't know how your mind works, when I see this, the focus shifts from the message and it goes to the messenger. That's exactly what happens in me. See, now the focus is not primarily on the issue of should the cyclist have space, should we make space for him? I tend to think my eye goes to, why are you blocking the cyclist's path? And I think naturally this is how people work. When, when someone is delivering a message and the hypocrisy of their life is clear, it shifts the focus from the message to the messenger. To the messenger. And as Christians, we do not want to draw much attention to ourselves. Uh, we want to live a life that draws much atten attention to the greatness and glory of Christ. And see, a, a condemning, judgmental attitude towards people where we go around condemning, condemning. I'm not saying speaking the truth in love. Speaking the truth in love is something that we have to do. But when we have this cutting, condemning, critical spirit towards people, what it does in people is it makes them want to judge us by that same standard. It, it, it makes the world that we live in look at you and wait for you to be hypocritical. Because as soon as you're hypocritical, I don't have to listen to your message. And so I believe what Jesus is giving us here is just good practical advice. He says you need to be careful in how you judge people. Your attitude, there's no place for a condemning, judgmental spirit. All it's going to do is show you to be a hypocrite. That's the only thing it's going to do. And so I would say the first, the first thing we need to do here is recognize our propensity towards hypocrisy. We just need to recognize this. How do we handle these things where we need to speak the truth of love and stand on the word of God and where there's moral error, we make decisions to speak up and to, to say what is true, but at the same time not have that condemning spirit. It starts with just recognizing our propensity towards hypocrisy. Number two is that we need to judge with humility and mercy. That our judgment, that as we call out sin, as we call out error, what, what we need to do is recognize our propensity towards hypocrisy, so work on our own lives, deal with the mess of our own life, spend that energy there, but then we move out into the world and we move out with mercy and humility. Mercy and humility. There are times when Christians in love need to speak up. There are often times when we need to get into messy situations there are times when we need to warn people about the direction that they're going. But God wants that message to be carried by people who have humility, who are, who are full of mercy when we correct error and sin. Now, where does this mercy and humility mixed with speaking the truth, where does that even come from? Like, where do you, if you're going to go looking for mercy and humility mixed with judgment, when Jesus says, start judging Justly, where do you look to find that humility and mercy? Well, let me give you a few places. First, is just recognize that my judgment of others doesn't matter ultimately. I don't know if you ever think about this, but, but I, I try to think about this on a regular basis, and it helps to kind of take me down a few notches, just recognizing that my judgment, your judgment of people, ultimately doesn't matter. Like, it just doesn't matter. Jesus is the judge of the world, and he will judge the world in righteousness. And in the final analysis, my evaluation of people carries zero weight. No weight at all. When, when the Lord Jesus is judging another person, he's not going to say, hey, can you, just, can you just hold on for a second? Just wait a second. Hey, Dan, what do you think about this guy? In or out? In or out? That's not going to happen. Or what about, this, what about this person? What kind of reward should this person get? Is this a golden buzzer moment? Like, do you want to hit the golden buzzer? All the rewards, it's just amazing. What do you think? That's not going to happen in any way, shape, or form. And the more I think about how my evaluation is not ultimate, that my evaluation of a person or a situation has, it carries, the only weight that it carries is to the degree that it lines up with God's word. So just, it's not, it's like I am not the final say Ultimately, my opinion really doesn't even matter. And even if I see things right, even if I'm seeing a situation right where there's real error, where, where someone is actually sinning and acting in a wrong way, it does not justify 
a condescending, critical, judgmental, condemning spirit. That, that my natural inclination to be judgmental and condemning in my spirit towards people is actually never helpful in any way, shape, or form. Sometimes we think if there is error and sin, if someone has done something bad to me, it justifies a wrong spirit towards them, but that is simply not true. It is never helpful. I've never heard a testimony of someone coming to faith in Christ, and they say, let me tell you how I came to faith in Christ. This is what happened. I met a bunch of Christians, and we went to church, and they shared the gospel with me, and they criticized me from top to bottom. Like, that's what they did. They judged me, condemned me every part of my life. They made fun of me. They belittled me. They talked down to me, and I said, that's what I want. I want to follow Christ. That never happens. So it's like even if it is true that someone is in egregious error, there's, it's still not beneficial or helpful to have a condescending, critical attitude towards them. And so I think we just, we just have to, to recognize, okay, what's our place? God is the judge of the world. He's the judge of the world. Another place I think humility comes from mercy comes from, is recognizing that Jesus does not have a judgmental and condemning spirit towards people, but is full of mercy. Now, Jesus is the judge of the world, and he will judge the world in righteousness. But when you look at Jesus in the Gospels, what you see is that the rightful judge of the world, the way he carried himself, is that he did not have this, this spirit, this critical, condescending Spirit, where he just cut and cut and cut needlessly. Certainly, he stood on the truth. But he was full of grace and truth. There's a story about a situation that contrasts the way Jesus dealt with sinners and the way the Pharisees dealt with sinners in John chapter 8. And this is what it says. At dawn, he began, or I'm sorry, he went to the temple again, and all the people were coming to him, and he sat down and began to teach them. Then the scribes and the Pharisees brought a woman caught in adultery, making her stand in the center. Teacher, they said to him, this woman was caught in the act of committing adultery. In the law of Moses, or in the law, Moses commanded us to stone such a woman. What do you say? Now, this is a brutal scene. You want to talk about a brutal scene? This is a brutal scene. These two people, they're having a relationship that is not honoring to God, they are committing adultery. And these men, a group of men, they go and they grab her. And they take her out. They throw her on the ground. She wasn't expecting this to happen. And they're talking about executing her on the spot. According to the law, she is worthy of death. But notice there is no man here. There is no man. It's just they just grabbed the woman. They're taking the woman, putting her before Jesus, but they leave the man. And see, it takes two to tango, as we all know, and so in theory, he's equally worthy of death, but they just take her. And so it is hypocritical from the beginning, it is artificial from the beginning, and their heart's desire is to trap Jesus. So let's look at what Jesus says. They ask this to trap him in order that they might have evidence to accuse him. Jesus stooped down and started writing on the ground with his finger. When they persisted in questioning him, he stood up and said to them, the one without sin among you should be the first to to throw a stone at her. Then he stooped down again and continued writing on the ground. And when they heard this, they left one by one, starting with the older men. Only one, or only he was left, with the woman in the center. And when Jesus stood up, he said to her, woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? No one, Lord, she answered, neither do I condemn you, Jesus said. Go, and from now on, sin no more. And so you get a perfect situation where Jesus and the Pharisees, the religious, they agree that this woman is in sin. And so you get this perfect situation about what Jesus is going to do and what is his attitude and spirit and posture going to be like towards this woman and what is, what, what is the posture of the Pharisees and the scribes and the religious Elite. Now, there are three things to notice. First, Jesus does not throw the first stone. He does not throw the first stone. He says, the one without sin should be the first to throw a stone at her. Jesus is the rightful judge of the world. Now, I, I want to make this crystal clear. Jesus will judge the world. 
he will. He, he's going, his wrath is going to fall on the world. But I think here is a picture of Jesus' spirit towards this woman. He is the rightful judge of the earth. And he does not throw the first stone. Number two, Jesus does not deny her sinfulness. And he does not deny that she should die. Oftentimes, quote, non-judgmental people would rush into the situation and the premise of their argument, at least in the world we live in today, is that this is simply not sin. It's not sin. What's happening here is not sin. And therefore, there's no condemnation. There's no death. There's no penalty because there is no sin. This is the world that we live in. But Jesus does not deny the sin of the woman. How do we know that? Verse 11, he says, Neither do I condemn you, said Jesus. Go, and from now on, sin no more. This is sin. And if it is sin, then he would affirm the law of God that says that she should die. Number three, Jesus does not condemn her. When Jesus stood up, he said to her, Woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? No one, Lord, she said. Neither do I condemn you. Now here we have to ask a very important question. Here's the question. How is Jesus able to affirm the sin of the woman and the worthiness of her to die and yet give mercy? How does he do that? Because this is what religion says to the woman. Quote, maybe a quote, merciful religion. This is what merciful religion says to the woman. Religion says, woman, you are, in, you are in sin. Stop sinning, and here's your path to make it right. Go to church, obey the law, go to the temple, make your offerings and sacrifices. That's how you get out of it. You're worthy of condemnation. It is sinful. You're worthy of condemnation. Do all these things, and you'll get, get out of comf- or, uh, condemnation. What the culture today and what the world has said historically, secularism says to this woman, this is not sin. This is not sin. I know that's what the Bible says. It's not sin. This isn't sin. And therefore, there is no condemnation. Why would we talk about any type of judgment? Why is there any type of judgment? See, with religion, when religion condemns a person and says, that is sinful, you're worthy of death, it also justifies the spirit of condemnation towards them. And they say, until you get right, until you change your life, every aspect of your life, you're going to be condemned, but there's hope because you can actually be a better person. But secularism just says, no, 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 it's not even sin. So why any form of judgment on a person is completely wrong because it's not even sin. But this is what Jesus is able to say. Jesus is able to look at this woman and say, it is sin, and you should die. It is sin, and you should die. So how do you get out of it? How does he not condemn her? Well, what he also says to the woman is, I will be condemned in your place. I will be condemned in your place. And this is what the gospel is. It's an understanding that we are sinful. There's this understanding where we're sinful, but we don't say this. We don't say, okay, I need to earn it, earn it, earn it, be better, be better, be better, and maybe I can avoid condemnation. That's that there's no hope in religion. There's no hope in that. There's no hope in the Pharisaical system. That doesn't do anything except to condemn a person and say you can get better and that's good. And that's that's a good thing. That's what the world says. Or moralism or not moralism, secularism spends all their time just saying, I'm not a bad person. No, I'm not a bad person. I feel guilty all the time, but I'm not a bad person. It's these other people that are putting pressure on me. Do you know why you feel guilty? It's because you are guilty. That's why you feel guilty. If you're not a Christian, you feel condemned because you are condemned. You are guilty. And so you spend all the time just trying to rationalize that it's not sin and I'm not worthy of judgment or any type of death. But what it looks like to become a Christian is you look Jesus in the eye and you say, I've sinned against you. And I know I should die. Thank you for dying in my place. 
Thank you for dying in my place. See, Christ, he is our mercy. He is, he is the only source of mercy in the world. That's it. Because what happens is that the judge comes off his seat and he's condemned. That's what he does on the cross. He's condemned. The condemnation we deserve, he took. And he did it voluntarily, and he did it because he loves you. Because that's our only hope. That's the only way. So Christ is our mercy. And see, as Christians, we have such an incredible opportunity in our culture, in our families, to represent Christ well. Jesus was the perfect mix of courage, standing on God's word, and mercy. He stands on God's word, and he's so full of mercy he was fearless and yet did not have a judgmental and condemning spirit towards anybody, including his enemies. And so we have a great opportunity. We have a great opportunity to represent Christ well to one another, and we have a great opportunity to represent Christ well in the world. And the way we do it is not by being a Pharisee and condemning everybody and saying, be better, then you won't die. And it's not by going with the world and secularism by saying, it's not really sin, it's not really sin, I know it's not sin, it's not really sin, so you don't need to feel bad. But it's by telling the world that sin leads to death and Jesus was condemned on your behalf. And he's offering you a relationship, he's offering you forgiveness, he's offering you eternal life. And if that is our spirit, if that is our spirit towards people, I think we are like a big bright light in a dark world. When we look at people who are clearly in the wrong, and instead of assuming you know everything, instead of assuming that you know everything about their past, instead of being hypocritical in your judgment of them, you hold to the scriptures and you point them to Christ. You point them to Christ. And so I see this as just a wonderful thing for us as a church. And I hope this is the way we are as a church. When people come in through the doors, we're not worldly, denying the reality of sin, and we're not Pharisees saying, you're sinful, but there's hope because you can read the Bible. But rather, we point to the mercy of Christ. Let's go ahead and close. Lord Jesus, we thank you that you, you are the only source of mercy in in the world, Lord, you, the divine judge of the universe, you came down and you were condemned. You tasted the wrath of God on our behalf, Lord, that that woman, what that woman deserved on that day was death, and you died for her. You died in her place. And I pray that we would be men and women like that. We would be men and women who are inwardly transformed by your mercy. And I pray we wouldn't be Pharisees and I pray we would not be worldly, but we would be Christians. And so God help us, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen.